Thank you, uh, Yuan and uh, Hiroki. Uh, now, uh, I don't think uh, Laurent mentioned it, but uh, uh, we're going to continue by talking uh, about Brexit. This time we're talking about what it's like to develop a European fintech at a time of uh, Brexit. Um, so before we kick off, as we've done with all our panels uh, so far today, if you guys just want to uh, take, we're just going to have one minute since uh, this is quite a short panel, only 20 minutes long. So just one minute each to uh, tell us about yourselves and uh, your startup. So Hiroki, if you want to start. Yeah, sure. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Hiroki. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, GoCardless. And what we do is we make it really easy for businesses to accept recurring payments by building technology on top of bank-to-bank -bank systems like Direct Debit. Wow, that was quick. Uh, Johan. Hello. Um, I am John Birkovic from Bankin, CEO and co-founder. What we do at Bankin is we simplify money management. So we provide an universal app with the best user experience to manage your money, uh, to do your daily tasks like checking your accounts, do a transfer, but also to get personal advice based on our financial data. And also you can subscribe to financial products, savings, mortgage, etc., directly in our app. So we have more than 2.4 million users across Europe today, and we are the first PSD2 license in Europe and the only one in France. And uh, just in case people weren't aware from your accent, you're, you're, based, you're based in France. Yeah, I'm based in Paris, yeah. Right, okay. Um, now, when the Brexit vote came through, I was uh, at an alpaca farm in the Negev desert. Uh, where were you guys, and what was your reaction? Hmm. Johan. Uh, astonished. Uh, we were very surprised. Uh, we regret this situation. Uh, while in parallel, the European Commission is trying to harmonize the market. There is a huge effort to do it, and PSD2 is one part of it. It's, we, we were working uh, uh, during seven years for PSD2, and this, this year is now the time of PSD2. And now we discover that maybe UK will be out of this uh, uh, subject. Uh, but there, will also, there is a lot of other subjects about financial products, because it's very local market with specificities uh, regu local regulations for savings, credit, etc. Uh, for KYC, the European Commission is trying to harmonize uh, the KYC, uh, harmonize the regulation to distribute products across Europe to allow a French guy to buy a German product and a German guy to buy a, a, a UK product. But now with the Brexit, we do not know how to deal with the UK. And just to be clear, you, you are in the UK. You yeah, we, yeah, we, you yeah, we operate customers. in the UK, yeah. And uh, Hiroki? Um, yeah, I, I think for me, my reaction was a lot more personal. Uh, so, uh, you know, I live in London. Uh, we're based in the UK. Um, and I remember waking up in the morning um, and seeing the news and just being in, in shock, really, like uh, disbelief, because I, I was so certain that it would go the other way. Um, and all I really remember is turning up in the office and it feeling like a like a funeral, right? You, you know, everyone was really, really shocked that this had happened, and especially if you live in London, uh, the sentiment in London is very different from the sentiment in other parts of the UK, so, you know, um, it, it was probably just 24 hours of pure shock, uh, it was uh, how, how, I, how I remember it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think my, my jaw just dropped and I was just watching the TV for just half an hour, like, just... Yeah, exactly, couldn't yeah. Couldn't actually close my mouth for, for a while. Um, I mean, while we're on the subject, Hiroki, of course, uh, I, I just read, I think it was just last week, the news uh, came out, uh, or suddenly I, I came across it, that you are opening a, an office in Paris now. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, Valérie Pérez uh, got to you uh, uh, earlier, on an earlier occasion. But I'm curious to know, uh, was that anyway part of your strategy, or would that have happened had Brexit not have happened? Yeah, I mean, you, the answer is yes, it would have happened. Um, you know, for, for us, the reason we're opening an office in Paris is, is not because of Brexit, it's because we want to be closer to our customers. Uh, and that would have happened whether Brexit had happened or not. Um, you know, I, I think that actually, in many ways, Brexit in, in and of itself doesn't affect us that much because you're either a, a fintech company that's going to focus on an individual market, and uh, you see a lot of fintech companies do that, or generally speaking, the fintech companies that go internationally, it's not just about one or two countries, it's about really creating a, a global network. Um, and if that's the case, then you need to be able to figure out how regulation works, not in one or two countries or one or two uh, regions, it's uh, in many countries. So re really for us, it just adds one more regulation, one more geography or region that we need to think about to the overall mix. 
Uh, so it's not made a huge difference in terms of the trajectory and the strategy for us. Um, this, this would have happened regardless. Do you think that's replicated across uh, London, uh, London-based uh, fintechs? Cause, I mean, uh, perhaps there, there is hope after all this fear about talent uh, kind of, you know, moving back to the continent or fintechs moving over here. And we saw the ministers from uh, Luxembourg, Lithuania and, uh, and France and Belgium here before. And clearly they all want a piece of the action. Uh, yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe the UK doesn't have so much to worry about. Yeah. Um, well, no, I, I think that there are other reasons to be worried about Brexit, right? So, you know, it doesn't change our strategy as a company from a fintech perspective. Uh, but, you know, from a talent perspective, I think that that's where there's the biggest uh, potential impact and where we're most worried. So, you know, we've already had one or two employees that have left the company because they're worried about what's happening with Brexit. Um, one of them wasn't even going back to Europe. They were going back to the US. They just didn't like the sentiment. Um, we've also noticed that applications from Europe are, are definitely anecdotally falling. Um, so I think that the ability to scale a company in, in London may get harder. And, you know, certainly when we were first starting Go Cardless, being based in London, a, a big part of that was because we believed there was a talent pool from across Europe that we could hire from. Um, and if that stops being the case, then I think that it will impact potentially the London as a hub. Um, not necessarily threaten the existing players in, in, in existing companies in London, but certainly might change the, the hiring strategy and where, where the teams are based in the long term. And Johan, you're obviously based here, you're a French fintech, you do have British customers. Uh, did you have any plans to kind of expand more in the UK or to do more with the UK before Brexit that perhaps you've, you've put on ice now or has it just had no effect on you whatsoever, other than perhaps making talent more available because of all the talented French uh, people that may have already started coming back? It has effect for us because, as I said, Piazzi2 just arrived, so we have a blue ocean in all the European market to access to data with common rules, common technology, but there is uncertainty about the UK. So should I invest in the UK now, or should I prefer to invest in Germany or in Spain? There is less in, uh, uncertainty in Germany and Spain than in the, in the UK, because we do not know tomorrow how it will be handled how we will be able to connect to banks. There is now, it's quite synchronized with open banking in the UK and what's going on in France and in Germany, but in two years from now, what's going on? So when we invest, we invest a lot and it's for the long term. So there is quite uncertainty about this. So we, uh, we start operating in the UK before the Brexit. Now the question is, will banking accelerate as fast as we would do before the Brexit in the UK instead of doing it in Germany or in Spain. And do you think that you will or you're just kind of waiting? No, it's, it's still, still up in the air. Yeah, thinking about it. Okay, and, and as I say, you know, for those of you who have been here throughout the day, we've had the, the president of the, uh, of the uh, Ile, de, uh, Ile de France region that, that includes Paris. We've had the French finance minister. We've had the Bank de France governor. Uh, there's clearly a desire to kind of, let's say, take uh, London or supplant London as the kind of fintech hub of Europe and Paris feels that it's got a really good chance of doing so. Uh, do you think Paris can do it? Yeah, I, 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 there is already some real action about this. As you see PSD2, there is very few countries that have transposed in national law the PSD2. And France was, was the first, one of the first. Um, and UK also. But the, the government they told us we will transpose, transpose the, the, the law in national uh, law very quickly to attract fintech. And that's why we were the first PSD2 license in Europe, also because the regulator have built a special task force to accelerate the processes and to show to all the European, other European and other countries and to the UK financial industry that France can be the next new center of financial industry in Europe, EBI have also uh, will change in Paris. So I think the government, as said Bruno Le Maire just before, really want to create a startup nation in France with a, f a great focus on fintechs. And it has already impact. But there is one thing the France should do just now to increase its impact. PSD2 is only for payment account. They should open to credit and saving account. Because if we could create a secure connection for payment account. Why should not 
use the same connection for other accounts because today 80% of the account connecting in Europe are not payment account. It's saving credit. And I'm working very hard with the government to go further on this direction. There is still work to do, but I think it will arrive soon and it will have a huge impact for Europe and for France. Hiroki, can Paris take London's crown? You're uh, opening up an office here. Do you think many others will follow? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that I think the way I think about it is that London's potentially missed an opportunity as opposed to it being dethroned, right? Um, if you look at how things are played out in Silicon Valley and in the US, you know, very clearly Silicon Valley has the, taken the crown of technology, um, the, of the technology industry in the US. And I think London had that opportunity, um, still maybe has that opportunity depending on how things go. Uh, there, there is a clear sort of gap between the maturity of London as a market and uh, the rest of Europe. But I think now there's a much more real possibility that that hub will be spread out more across different cities around the, Europe. And that won't necessarily be a bad thing. Um, I think that each city and each country has its own culture that it brings, and uh, those cultures lend themselves to making certain types of startup more or less... Uh, viable or successful in those markets. So, you know, I, I think what, what, what I anticipate is that actually um, the, the ecosystem will be m more spread out uh, across Europe as a result of Brexit uh, and le less centered around uh, London. And how much does that come down to passporting? Like, let's say hypothetically, uh, in contrast to what the ministers were saying, the UK is able to maintain passporting rights for, uh, for, for banks. Um, would that kind of uh, mean that things no. uh, should be more or less the same? I, I don't think so. Say, no. I, 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 don't th I think the passporting thing's a bit of a red herring. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it, there's a it, not an, uh, inconsequential, but not a life-threatening amount of cost and complexity involved in getting multiple regulatory approvals, right? Um, so I, I don't think it will, that will make a big difference. I think for me, the, the big thing is talent. Um, if it's if all of a sudden we have to go through an immigration process for every European citizen that we want to hire into London, you know, th that very act is going to be too slow for many startups. And I also, I think, will put off a lot of potential talent uh, that would, c would have considered moving to London otherwise. And I, so I think that that's the only reason, uh, the one and only reason I, I see there being an impact of Brexit on the London ecosystem. Uh, I, and I'm not sure if uh, Le Ramona has made it into the uh, French uh, lexicon just yet, but, but can we try and be positive for a moment, perhaps? I mean, is there any chance that maybe Brexit will push London fintechs to do things that they otherwise wouldn't, expand more quickly uh, into Europe, uh, uh, perhaps uh, take risks that they might have otherwise shied, shied away from? Can, can you, either of you see any silver lining, not, not necessarily for Paris, I mean, talking about for yeah, London uh, fintechs? Uh, uh, for, for me, I, I think that... Um it's not so much that I see an additional opportunity from Brexit, but I think that it underlines the value that a lot of fintech companies can bring to the world, right? But what I think is quite interesting in, about fintech as a, an industry is that you, you're moving from a world in which financial services are provided by single institutions that focus across many products to businesses that are set up solely to solve a, a single product and a single problem. Um, and then expanding that internationally, right? Um, so it's kind of expanding in a very different way. Um, I think that that model makes a lot of sense. Um, and actually have the, these kind of gaps that Brexit create between the UK and Europe it underlines the importance of filling them, right? And uh, that's where I think the, the, a lot of fintech companies can add value is by going to the trouble of figuring out these passporting issues, going to the trouble of stitching all of these networks and these systems together and then providing products that can work across countries. Um, so, uh, you know, there I think it's not so much an opportunity, but, it, um, you know, it's, it's an area where we can really add value. Uh, Johan, do you see any positives for, for London fintechs aside from the opportunity to come to, uh, to Paris and experience everything it has to offer? For London fintechs, maybe the opportunity is to focus on China or the US um, instead of... Because we'll be signing trade deals with them like the minute 
uh, Britain, you know, exits the EU. So, yeah, but for us, for example, when we see do we invest in the UK or other countries? Now, if we have the European market, but if we we go further and we say, wait, now we are the leader in Europe, what's the next stage? Is it the UK or is it China or uh, is it US? The more the the the, the market is, is is big with harmonized rules, the the easiest. The easier it is to, to, to go into this market. So that's why we are not in, in, uh, in Belgium. Belgium is very difficult to connect to banks with very few people. <laughs> uh, the population is quite uh, limited with uh, multiple language. And we heard from Prodigy Finance this morning that the Belgian regulator wouldn't, would like the, one of the only countries in the world that wouldn't let them set up. Uh, Kind of, you know, in that country to provide uh, student loans to to Belgians who can't get it hmm. in local banks. So maybe that's another reason <laughs> uh, you're not in Belgium. Um, if the ministers are still listening, um, but I want to move on to something which I know you've mentioned a couple of times, not least because you were kind of helped draft it as well. We're talking about PSD2, open banking. Uh, does that um, kind of the, the positive that's going to come, and, and this also for you as well, Hiroki, does the positive that's coming already, and you expect to come, the kind of uh, PSD2 dividend, let's call it, um, will that offset? Uh, to some degree, the kind of cloud, let's say, or the negativity associated with Brexit is the positive of PSD2. Does that outweigh, to any extent, the kind of negative of Brexit? I'm not sure to get the question about it. Well, Sorry. I mean, PSD2 is obviously incredibly beneficial for a startup. Mm. Like you have access to reams of data that you didn't have before, uh, and and by virtue of that, probably access to more to more customers. Mm. So, is the boost that you're expecting there, for example, uh, more than, let's say? the uh, potential um, decline or, or impact that you're going to sure. feel among your British customers? Sure, sure. The PSD2 is harmonizing the European market. It's 500,000 millions of consumers. It's huge. So the UK market is one of the biggest European market. But now, if there is uncertainty, maybe we can focus on the other uh, 40, um, 150 million consumers that are not in the UK market. So PSD2 is a huge impact in the European market, but also a huge impact for the world because we are showing to the world how now we can access to data and the innovation we can do with those data. Uh, so PSD2 is a real big bang in, in the financial industry. Uh, it's the first step of all the intelligence, all these, the, uh, the, uh, we, we talk of artificial intelligence, is based on data. Now we will start to work very hard on this, thanks to the data we can now retrieve from banks that was only used by banks that innovate very few on data. Maybe they accelerate now, but see, um, until now it, they were quite, quite uh, sl slow about this. Now it's, it will start. So it's a real big bend. So with the Brexit, it's, we regret that, but it's not a big deal for us. And uh, Hiroki, I mean, you've talked about the, the downside, especially regarding talent. Uh, is, is, the, is the positive kind of boost to go cardless as uh, potential for growth? It, it, does that to any extent outweigh or offset at least the, the impact that, that, Brexit, uh, that Brexit is having yeah. and potentially will have? Well, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about PSD2 um, in relation to the UK is actually this is an area where I think UK are doing better than Europe, uh, and you know you've got open banking in the UK, which is effectively the UK's sort of implementation of PSD2 and its interpretation. And I think that a lot of that's much closer to reality than anything else I've seen in PSD2, um, and being done in a way that I think is more meaningful. You know, standardising it in a centralised way, having a stand an, an API that is common across banks. Um, these are all things that don't really seem to exist with PSD2 uh, across uh, the continent. Um, so I actually think that there's lessons that the rest of Europe can learn and approaches that they can take based on what's going on with open banking that I think would be very beneficial uh, to sort of the whole of Europe. So, you know, I, I actually think uh, the way I see, see it is that open banking in the UK gives us a, an opportunity to really test out some of the concepts and ideas of PSD2 earlier than uh, PSD2 actually gets implemented, right? Like, they've gone into beta uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know that they've done the first sort of API calls, and, you know, this is a real thing. Uh, so, you know, it, it feels much more tangible. Um, so I, I think there's a big opportunity there, and we're, we're very excited about exploring it. 
Okay, well, I think maybe it's good that we can try and end on a, on a positive note. So I want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Hiroki and uh, Johan, uh, for that fascinating discussion. You.